Hello and welcome once again to the Dwarven Tavern. I am your host, Lyric, and today we are going to be continuing the Amazing Adventures series. Um, this is the third of the rule books for this uh, series, and it is called the Manual of Monsters. This one is comparatively thinner. Um, I think it has a lot less to it, uh, which kind of uh, coexists with the whole thinner part of the book. So, um, diving right in, I think this book has maybe, let's see, one, two, three, four different chapters, um, if you could even call them that. First one is Introduction, uh, the Complete Bestiary, or Bestiary, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, the Appendix of Monsters of Mythology, and Appendix 2, which is Monsters as Player Characters, which we will get to in a minute, but I think right off the bat, that is a cool topic to cover, because you never know who wants to create new monsters and what monsters would be most fitting for your campaign until you actually play it. So that is pretty cool. So diving into the introduction, welcome to the Amazing Adventures Manual of Monsters. In the original Amazing Adventures rulebook, we offer a complete bestiary full of monsters uniquely appropriate to a pulp campaign, which is very true. They had werewolves and vampires and mummies and the like, stuff that you would find in an Indiana Jones movie. So secondly, um, that was back in 2012, which we reviewed a few weeks ago, <laughs> and the game was well received. Now we have moved on to the second printing of that work and given a whole new line of facelift, including hardcover release of our three core books, which this is one, uh, Companion is two, and uh, the original Amazing Adventures rule book right here is the first one done. Back to the intro. While many of the monsters herein will look familiar, as they have been drawn from other castles and crusade sources, all have been slightly tweaked to fit your pulp campaign, and uh, with average hit points and experience values and sanity ratings uh, for each creature added. We have tried to keep the kinds of creatures that feel like they could fit into a pulp world. We will leave it to you, our fans, to judge whether we have succeeded. In addition, you will find here in approximately two dozen brand new monsters, two dozen seems like kind of a small number, don't you think? Um, which have never been before published for the Seas engine. Some have been inspired by other gaming sources, some by pulp sources, some based on fan requests, and some just came out of the author twisted imagination. So, um, going to the second part of the introduction which I find very helpful which is the how to use the manual of monsters normally when you have a some sort of monster manual you don't really have a how to use them appropriately and how to uh, what each of the individual parts stand for this is kind of uh, outlining which I kind of think is consistent with the amazing adventure series is that they're very very uh, articulate with the details. They are. They make sure to underline anything that may have confusion, and they have a definition of things that needs definition. So I find that very consistent with this whole series. It's not just uh, this book. So that's very nice. How to read the templates? Um, for example, 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 <laughs> number encountered. Uh, this number of creature normally encountered, it is, in some cases, two, list, you know, two listings exist, denoting general encounters and encounters in the creature's lair. A giant ant, for example, will be found in groups of 10 to 60 in the wild, but in colonies 100 to 1,000 in the nest. So, that's cool. Um, again, that's something that a lot of other gaming systems don't really think of to do. Um, so, because sometimes you do have creatures described, like for example, in D&D 3.5, the Monster Manual, they normally don't list the exact number of encounters, however, in the paragraph describing the creature, it may say that they come in packs. However, if you're a DM like me, um, and you're very young when you started DMing, you don't really look into those details. So, hey, excuse me, so it's kind of, um, laying that out specifically, that's very nice. So, size, um, there are three sizes of uh, monsters, small, medium, and large. Hit dice, move, AC, attacks, um, the type of normal attacks this creature has, and the damage dealt by each. 
If the attacks are listed as and, that means that the creature has multiple attacks per round. Special, which is very important, special attacks or abilities such as magical powers, poison, class abilities, etc. are listed here. If a creature's special entry has SR, this represents the creature's spell resistance. That's cool. So the see Amazing Adventures page 97 for more on spell resistance. Sanity, because this game does delve into the sanity. Um, the sanity loss inflicted by the creature if the game master chooses to use these rules. So again, sanity is optional. It is not something that you absolutely have to do to make this campaign work. However, it is laid out for you if you indeed want to use it. Again, very cool. Saves. Like humans, most monsters have three primes. Unlike humans, monsters' primes are generally either all three physical attributes, strength, dex, and con, or all three mental attributes, which is int, whiz, and ka. So some extraordinary monsters have all attributes as prime. These are designated as P, M, unless otherwise listed, because P stands for physical, M stands for mental. Unless otherwise listed, attributes are average, and thus monsters gain their hit dice plus five for, actually wrote plus, for prime checks and their hit dice for non-prime checks. For example, a monster with 3D8 hit dice that doesn't sound right, but I guess it is. And M saves have to make a saving throw against a mind-affecting spell. This would normally be a wisdom save. The monster is assumed to have an average wisdom, providing no bonus or penalty. Thus, the game master rules uh, duh, duh, D20 plus blank plus 3 for his 3D8 hit die. Since the monster saves are mental, his challenge base is 12. If the same monster has... Uh, physical savings instead of mental, the game master would use 18 for the challenge base. Then intelligence, the general in this is this is new. The uh, this is a general assessment of the intellect of the creature. Animal denotes that the intellect of the of the lower animal, such as a dog or cat. Uh, even intelligent animals such as apes have animal intelligence as they have not yet evolved to quite the reasoning power of human beings. Low means low human intelligence, probably denoting an int score of between 6 and 8. Average is average intelligence score of 9 to 12, and high is a score higher than 12. At the game master's option, the creatures or creatures with intellect other than an average may see mental saves or checks based on intel in intelligence <laughs> intelligence gain bonuses or penalties for the score god why was that so hard for me to read um alignment so before i get into alignment that is pretty cool that they make sure to have the intelligence lined out as something separate because intelligence does change and vary depending on what the creature is that's very cool alignment um Type, uh, this is like um, animal, construct, dragon, fey, humanoid, so on and so forth. Um, then it even has the experience points values of the creature laid out in the beginning of the book, all nice and neat for you right here in a nice little table. Again, Lyric likes herself some tables. So, uh, specials, which is one, two, and three. Um, and then it goes on to monster creation. Look at that artwork too. So, so classically pretty, nice and well done. Uh, at some point, going into the monster creation, at some point in every game, Game Master feels the need for a new monster in his or her game. Uh, the monsters in the book may become tired, as in you've used them a lot. So, the player may have memorized all their stats and weaknesses, uh, meaning there is no challenge or fear left which that you can see in the rules lawyer video that I did for the beginners videos um, is something that a lot of experienced gamers do when they memorize the the stats and the health and the experience points of said monsters that are used frequently then it becomes harder to deal with someone who already knows those rules because they automatically assume that they know the rules when in fact the GM could be um, messing it up a little bit for whoever is playing. So, please watch that video and uh, this is also something that can help you avoid that continuous uh, problem that rule rules lawyers create. So, again, 
check out that video and let's continue here. Or the goal of the adventure might require something unique that has not yet been encountered. At these times, the GM sets off on a quest to design something new, intriguing, exciting, and frightening. All in one. All in one bundle. Creating monsters is both fun and challenging. Whether it is a hybrid werewolf, a genetically enhanced mutant alligator, or something completely new and altogether terrifying. Such as a giant mosquito with a proboscis the size of a fucking, I don't know, uh, Lance. <laughs> yeah, um, being allergic to mosquitoes, that shit is terrifying to me. So, when she, uh, sets out about creating a new monster, the GM, oh, they used a female GM, should keep in mind a few basic concepts and design elements regarding balance and technical concerns. But in the end, there is no limit to your imagination and your creativity can't accomplish. So, it doesn't really go in depth with, well, I can mean it kind of does. Um, it says you can alter existing monsters um, in this book and other books. Then it goes to changing the description, which you can, uh, for example, just picking a monster randomly out of the bestiary, an antlion, you can change the description for that and use the stats. Um, or the unique monster, and this is coming up with something completely different using the monster's layer in the book um, as... Uh, examples on which to base your new monster off of. So, very cool. Um, it's nice that they kept the creative mind in mind. So, then it goes on to the complete bestiary. I pronounce it that way because they spelled it weird. It's complete, but pleat is not E-T-E, -E, it's E-A-T, so complete. I'm just, I'm just fucking around with this. So, um, then the complete bestiary. Um, has monsters uh, that you would probably find in the pulp campaign, such as aliens for a sci-fi game, um, the ab abomination of the toad god, which what even? Uh, these horrific monstrosities resemble an enormous toad with six slathering tentacles surrounding the head. Slathering? Is that really the right word they should have used there? Slathering. I feel like that's actually pretty appropriate <laughs> for a toad. They are said to be servitors of the great old one known only as the Toad God, its true name being lost in the mist of time. It is said that they haunt the shadow swamps, shadowy swamps, and slots. Okay, it's supposed to say swamps here, but it says swaps. So... And slime polluted bogs of the world emerging from the foul places only when called forth by sorcerers and occultists. So they have uh, chaotic evil as their alignment. Uh, numbers encountered usually one. They are large. Uh, they have an average of 61 hit points. They move 30 feet. Holy shit. They have a, a, a what is it called? A. I want to say AC, but I'm trying to think of the actual word. Armor class um, of 19 attacks is six, six tentacles and a bite. Um, so they have six tentacles and a bite per round. Uh, they have 1d6 to 1d8 sanity saves, or they do, yeah, they do that much sanity uh, to the player. They have all physical saves. Uh, they have very low, low to average intelligence, so they are kind of on the same level as an average human. Their alignment is chaotic evil, and they're a type aberration. And one, uh, 1950 plus 10 is an average of 2,500 experience points for defeating these monsters because they are pretty badass. Then they have specials, which is alluring voice, constrict, damage immunity, horrific, horrific, horrific laughter, Improved grab and regeneration, which is all defined even further in the side right here until it goes into the next monster. So, um, that is pretty much how all the monsters are laid out. Very seldomly do they have a picture of the monster, but this is the, the toad right here. The abomination of the toad god. I might have to use that in a different campaign. We will see, I'm sure. So, um, it does have pretty average monsters. Harpy, Hellhound, Hiccup! Uh, the snake men talk off because this does deal with sanity. Of course, the Call of Cthulhu monsters or Call of Cthulhu type monsters would be in this game. Uh, succubus, um, uh, vampire, uh, spiders, the like. Those are can all be found in 
the complete bestiary. It's going to bother me. I know it's probably right in some uh, old archaic type of spelling, or it's a different way to spell complete, but it's going to bother me for the rest of my life. Complete. Appendix. Monsters of Mythology. This one, reading straight from the book, all of the monsters in the section originally appeared in the Troll Lord games of Gods and Monsters source book for the Castles and Crusades role-playing game. We reproduced them here as an excellent reference source of the monsters from various mythologies around the world, any of which could be encountered by your pulp characters or heroes as they explore abandoned ruins, tracking down ancient prophecies, and battle deranged and twisted mystery cults. We also recommend Of Gods and Monsters Sourcebook, which is 100% compatible with Amazing Adventures, as an excellent resource for expanding the mythological elements of your game. So this section is all about mythology. This is a monster that you would find in other types of other parts of the world. Um, however, it is not a complete source book. Um, this is just kind of a, a taste test of mythology. So uh, probably we'll have to check out Of Gods and Monsters to see if that expands on this a little bit more. But going off of the monsters in this book, I feel like you could have a complete campaign in those types of areas. For example, the American Indian, which should be called um, the, um, the Native Americans, um, the Uktena, which is a Cherokee monster, uh, is 100 foot long winged snakes that roams the material plane, attacking the bravest of hunters. It commonly comes from other planes flying out of portal caves and ravaging the countryside, eating the best of hunters from the surrounding tribes. Its magical feathers resist all normal missile attacks. They drew it without feathers. So, um, that uh, is one of the monsters. Then it has the Talanua, um, the Misipisu, <laughs> I like that name, which is a water panther of the Great Lake Indians, um, one-eyed giant of the Plains Indians, uh, the lightning giants of the Iroquois, um, and then it goes on to, like it has a, a few more, uh, Aztec, which has the red snake, and the Shuokoatl, which I'm pronouncing that wrong, I know, then the Celtic, which has Kelpie, hooded spirits, leprechauns, um, firebolgs, uh, Egyptian, which has minions of Set, Fire Snake, Greek, the Greek Titan, which is the most, I don't know, the iconic monster of Greek mythology. The Hecatonchir, which <laughs> I just butchered the shit out of that word, I'm sure, which is a hundred-handed one. Um, Cerberus, of course. Um, India, which is Vertra, Gold Ant, Snake Dragon. Okay, getting up on my high pedestal here again. Lyrics number one rule! I'm sure you can read it with me. Always include a pronunciation guide. Number one rule, if you are creating monsters or putting monsters in a different culture in your series or creating names out of the wazoo for the love of all that is holy and mythological, please put a pronunciation guide in the book or underneath their name because like me, I guarantee you there's going to be butchering of the names and I think that a Garuda, oh they have Garuda in here. Um, I did not know he was Indian. I thought he was Native American. But! No, I knew that he was Indian. I was just combining the two different types of Indian. So, anyway, um, please put a pronunciation guide in the book because I can guarantee you there's going to be some mispronunciation. And if the, if the DM or GM mispronounces anything in the game, it's going to sound funky and it's going to kind of break the fourth wall. At least it would for me. So then it goes on to Japan, which is the White Tiger and the Gashadokuro, which I always pronounce it the Odokuro, but Odokuro, either way, it is the same thing. However, one more reason to look into the mythological creatures on your own time. Um, let's read straight from the Gashadokuro book. Um, uh, as you may or may not know, I was a Japanese language and culture major in college, so I have taken Mythology of Japan classes before. So, um, reading straight from the book, Gashadokuro are created from gathering bones from people who have died of starvation. The only way a Gashadokuro can be detected before it appears is by hearing the ringing in one's ears. Uh, it surprises victims and continues to follow prey as long as some are alive. It seeks to bite the head off of each victim before it passes on to the next prey. The skeleton is 30 feet tall. Its dried old bones are hard and more like stone than bone. So. The reason I bring that up is because the Gashadokuro in 
uh, I guess, technical of Japanese mythology. Um, like with any mythology, you're going to find deviations and variations of that myth, so sometimes different types of monsters can branch out and spread across the world. So the Japanese mythology of the Gashidokuro, um, from what I have learned in my studies of Japanese mythology, is that it is over 70 feet tall, not 30 feet tall, and it eats, it doesn't eat anything, it collects the bodies, the bones of fallen warriors on a battlefield. So and, uh, or actually it's over a hundred feet tall. And it, it gets larger the more bones it collects, and it can be summoned only by evil sorceresses. So, um, again, I have studied up on the Gashadokuro and the Odokuro, and I know that this one is similar, but is kind of different than the original Gashadokuro of Japanese mythology. So, this does lay it out to some extent, but again, mythology can vary depending on who you ask and where you study. So please look it in. Please look into having uh, if you have mythology in game. This is great. This uses it to the extent that it needs to be used in game. However, um, it could be varied. It could be tweaked. It could be worked on. So please do some research. And if you like the book, what the book provides use it. I'm not saying don't. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's different. Um, so if you are kind of a nitpicky mythology uh, studier as I am, uh, that would bother me and get under my skin if I used it. So um, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. This book is fine. It's laid it out appropriately as you need to. It's given you the stats as you would find it to be. Um, it is chaotic evil, which is pretty much true. And it, uh, you know, it's one size large, well it would be kind of colossal if you were to do it uh, for the original Japanese mythology. Well, I don't know if colossal is... I think giant. I think giant would be how big it would normally be. However, again, this is the Gasha Dokoro of the Amazing Adventures world, so it could be different from our world, which is completely acceptable. So, Moving on, then it goes on to Norse and Roman mythology, and then second appendix, stepping off of my pedestal. Um, monsters as player characters. This is a really, really, really cool point to this book, is that it creates um, monsters um, that you can use as player characters, um, and it tweaks the rules that it already laid out in the book, for uh, if you wanted to use, say, a saber tooth tiger as a player character, in case you're playing an all animals campaign, or a snake man as a player character, which it lines out all of the rules here, and then you could use the second part, the second appendix, which is the last page, as a uh, and for tweaking it to make it a PC instead of an NPC. Or both. I mean, you could technically do it either way because I have had NPCs turn to PCs before. So, that is the book. Um, it is very, very short compared to the other ones. Um, and uh, while I find that to be concise, I do feel like this book was lacking. Um, I feel like even though these characters or these monsters are trying to keep the pulp game in mind, like dinosaurs, or wild boars, or birds of prey, or uh, oh, the abomination of the toad god. They do, I feel like they do lack monsters, and I feel like more could have been included because pulp is a genre that is pretty much made up by the person writing it. So, uh, while I do find this book lacking, I feel like it does stand on its own. Um, there are more monsters in the core rule book, which I think they are very similar, if not the same monsters. So you probably could, you don't even have to get this if you wanted to just play the game tomorrow. You could just buy this book and have the game set out, but if you're more in-depth for your monsters or you want more monsters available to you, you can totally get this book. Um, so 
That being said, I did find a few a few spelling errors, and I uh, do find this book lacking. So unfortunately, breaking the streak of five point uh, five point five five out of five axes, this book is going to receive four. So the Amazing Adventures Manual of Monsters is a four out of five axes from the Dwarven Tavern. Um, definitely check it out if you're curious about what type of monsters could be in a complete bestiary. Um, what type of monsters you could use in your pulp games, like gargoyles and herd animals. Um, just a reading from the book. There's hags that you can include, ghosts, genies, fishmen, the like, elementals, eagles, blah blah blah. So um, it does have a very wide range of monsters. I just feel like more could be included, just because I like the individuality of monsters and reading about monsters in the book and the description of the monsters while it is extremely in-depth I feel like it could be even more so um, but I digress that was the monster or manual of monsters I keep wanting to say mon monster manual but um, the manual of monsters of uh, the amazing adventure series done by Trollord Games um, this one is not done by Trey Jason Bay but I think it might be he just doesn't have his name on it so Please check them out at trolllord.com. I know I said in the past it's trolllordgames.com, but it's just trolllord or trolllord. And uh, it is of the Siege Engine Games. Please check them out on their website. And I have been Lear Goins of the Dwarven Tavern. You can find us at www.dwarventavern.net or email us at dwarventavern at twc.com. If you have any books that you would like reviewed uh, from your company or if you would like us to answer any questions or do any beginner's videos on certain aspects of gaming, please comment below. We are always interested in hearing feedback from our viewers. So. On behalf of the entire cast and crew of Dwarven Tavern, I am Lyric, and we wish for you to want for nothing but adventure. And at first I feared it, then I charged. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.